I've been in the livestock industry for 40 years. And when I first started out in my career, I thought I could fix everything with the right equipment. If I could just get the right magic equipment, I can fix half of things with equipment. The other half is the management. And I've done things to bring a lot of change and improve things. But the thing that drives me crazy is that the animal rights videos out there get a lot more views than good stuff the industry's doing. Well, I put up a video on pig stunning. It's at 2.6 million views right now. And uh, it needs some more likes on it. But what I've been finding on looking at that um, video, Temple Brand and Pig Stunning, is that there's a demographic on there called nasty boys. Uh, you know, we go heavy metal enthusiasts, you know, that sort of stuff. Uh, they're probably responsible for a lot of the dislikes because I gotta throw the F-bombs off the site. You know, if they drop an F-bomb, I, I take that off the site, and they're kicked off, but then they make a bunch of dislikes. And, but on the other hand, I don't take down dissent. If they say, be a vegan, I don't take that down. They can talk about, as long as it's civil, what you gotta take off your site is stuff that's not civil, because then your site just turns into garbage pit of, of a demographic I call nasty boys. Now, um, the animal rights people, you know, I've had a few animal uh, F-bombs from them, but actually more F-bombs from the nasty boys. Uh, and and they, they're allowed to talk on the site as long as they keep it civil. Uh, we've basically got to show what we do. I want to tell you right now that the good things the AKC is doing, I did not know about. We looked up their videos online back there on the phones, and the views are really low. And uh, although I was already talked about the election, young versus old, well, we need to get more young people involved. I go out and they do a dog training talk and it's all gray hairs like me. I go to a ranching meeting, it's all gray hairs. So what am I gonna spend most, and I'm a gray hair now. Uh, what do I spend most of my time doing on my speaking engagements? I give top priority to ones to young people. Somebody was telling me about you know, working with FFAs and things like that. We've got to get across the young person divide. The other big problem we have in agriculture is young people are totally getting away from the world of practical things. There's some pretty shocking results on some surveys. This survey was done in England, but it's still really shocking. They polled kids 16 to 23 years old, young adults, and they showed them pictures of different food items, and then pictures of places where they could come from. And only half of these young people could pair the pigs up with the bacon. I'm not kidding. Pigs and bacon? And 10% thought that eggs came from grain. So you're talking about a total disconnect here. And I think the fact that schools have taken the hands-on classes out of the schools, I think it's just absolutely beyond terrible, totally terrible, because those classes teach a practical problem solving. You know, kind of a practical resourcefulness that I think we're losing today. Let's go through some more survey data. How about the percentage of the public that associates different livestock species with factory farming? Pigs are at 34%, but beef is at 48%, which is surprising, because beef cattle spent the first half of their lives out on the range. And people just don't know about it. Just like I didn't know about some of the good things the AKC is doing, and about that $35 million worth of research on dog health. I knew about the Morris Foundation. That I knew about. But I did not know about the, all this other stuff that you talked about. And YouTube views are really down. Well, maybe you need to hire some young people just to do the social networking. I think grown-ups need to be working on the content. Young people, kids can work on how to do it. You know, this is uh, because it really frustrated me that I spent most of my career working on improving slaughterhouses. And then all that was up on the internet was how horrible they work. Well, we did some things about, I did some things about that. When I put pig stunning up four years ago, the industry had a fit. See, the tendency for some people in the industry to think we should just hide what we do. We need to be doing just the opposite. Clean up the house and then show everything. I'm at the point now where I want to put a camera into everything and stream it live out to the internet. I'm proud of the things that I've done. Okay, let's look at some other demographics. Five years ago, I um, had to do a book signing at a Costco, which involves sitting at a Costco book table for an entire day. It has not been publicized. Pretty boring. But actually, I decided to turn it into a little survey. And by the way, the Barnes & Noble is back there in the back, and I'm going to be happy to sign books at lunchtime. 
And so I picked up a copy of the book, and I walked up to every young family and every older couple that, was all, that walked by the book table. And I just went, I walked up to them and I said, I'm a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. I have a book about animal behavior. Do you have pets? I didn't say dogs. I didn't say anything. I said, do you have pets? I found out that 20% of young couples in South Denver shop at this Costco that's near I-25, South Denver, do not have any pets. No gerbil, no parakeet, nothing. We got to get, you know, and then schools, uh, you know, they take the animals out because they're afraid the kids are going to be allergic and all this kind of stuff. You know, we got to show kids that having animals is really a great thing. You know, I, I, there are some people out there saying, you know, that I, I, one thing, uh, somebody wrote on one of my websites that I was an evil Nazi, and uh, that a bunch of swear words of that, I, we blocked and deleted that. Now they say, go vegan, that I don't take down. Don't take down dissent. But then you've got to answer back to that without getting angry. And I'd recommend a 24-hour wait. <laughs> and never, never, never type directly on a website. Never. You write it out by hand first, or you write it on a Word document or something. But don't just get down the phone and type it on a website. You know, you've got to calm down and, and uh, write something sensible. OK, let's go on with some more survey data. Uh, which I think is pretty interesting. Uh, some surveys that were done in the state of Ohio about four years ago show that this tendency to want to buy local, people are really into buying local. That trumped organic. When it comes to food, they were more interested in buying local stuff than they were organic stuff. Well, maybe dogs can you know, take advantage of that movement. Um, and then there's a survey in 2012 that was in USA Today, and they asked little kids in school what their top concerns were animal welfare, the environment, and helping people. Now, a really important point is that the general public views on just about every issue are in between radical views on any issue. And the internet multiplies the voices of radicals. And that happens on both sides of any issue. I don't care what the issue is. And you've got to remember, the people you want to talk to is the general public. And when I was out in Hollywood, the Hollywood press was more like the general public. They were just curious. They asked questions like, what is a feedlot? They didn't know what it was. What is a, a CAFO? How do slaughterhouses work? And no, I'm not going to call them harvest facilities. That's BS. You want to sanitize a little bit? I'll, um, I'll call it um, a you know, processing plant or something like that. But I'm not going to call it a harvest facility. That is just absolute nonsense. And there was an interesting survey that was done about 15 years ago, and I think the results are still correct. There was a survey done at Texas A&M University, and they asked um, animal activists, they asked the general public, and they asked agriculture people, are you in favor of passing a bill on like Poultry Humane Slaughter Act, or about downed cows? And the thing that was interesting is the general public was right in the middle between the other two groups. Okay, the election already you know, got brought up, and I looked at all those charts and maps they had in the New York Times, there was a big demographic there on young versus old. But there's a bunch of stuff, if you read that really carefully, where the general public, how they voted, was in the middle between various activist groups. I don't do politics other than voting, which I keep for myself. Um, but I think you can get those charts. They're in the New York Times. The Wall Street Journal had some, too. Just look at the numbers. And it broke out into a whole lot of different demographics. But the one that you've got to get across is young versus old. You know, you got to get outside the box. I mean, I go to a meeting in Iowa of farmers. They're so far inside the box, they don't know the box exists. <laughs> so what can we do? Well, I worked at the American Meat Institute, and we made a video, Temple Grandin Beef Plant Video Tour. It's called Temple Grandin Beef Plant Video Tour. That's on YouTube. And then uh, Temple Grandin Pig Stunning. Um, the, even though it's got 2.6 million views, if you just type in Temple Grand, then it doesn't come up first because um, it's got a lot of dislikes on there. Because the nasty boys don't like it when they use the, when I throw them off there for just saying the F word and, and writing stuff that, oh, and one time Cheryl and I were going over, what was the filthiest one that they'd written? I mean, it's stuff that I'm not going to do, repeat, and we just block and delete those. But again, you take the F bombs off, you don't um, block dissent. So, we put up this, um, we made this video, the Temple Grandin Beef Plant video tour, 
and it was done uh, by the American Media Institute, one of our really good clients, and we had no script. I just went in there and we just narrated. And it starts out on the roof of the plant, looking over the cattle yards. Also, it was quiet there, and they could record what I was saying. And, uh, uh, okay. and, and I get distracted by stuff in the front. Like, I was messing around with papers, but I was doing it in the back. I would never do that in the front of the thing. And, and uh, you know, again, they were reluctant to put it up. And then the activists came out with these horrible videos showing kicking legs, saying this, implying that this was live cattle. They were hanging up live cattle and cutting them up. Well, my video shows the kicking legs, and I explain how that when you destroy the brain, the legs kick. Well, right now, we've got about 20,000 views. Need a bunch more. The activist video has over 400,000 views. Now, this is where they know how to communicate with the young. And this is where, um, where you guys are not doing it. We, I think one of the most important things that ag has got to do is to communicate with the young. And I'm going to have to do social media. You may have to hire, I know ACKC is like short on money right now. There's only one staff member that's really important right now. And that's somebody to communicate a no BS kind of communication. You know, and the, no, but you know, so when I did the, the meat plant video video, it doesn't have any PR fluff garbage in there. Now, uh, AMI did have it sent to a focus group in Florida. A lot of the people there didn't know who I was. And they're going, well, that's kind of weird. You know, you're putting autism, something important. So the video comes up and all my books showing that. And that's not that I'm an egomaniac. That's actually something the focus group recommended to improve its uh, credibility. But it just explains how it works. And uh, this is the kind of stuff we got to do. Uh, another thing that uh, I worked on after working on all the equipment was I worked with McDonald's Corporation on implementing their animal welfare program. And I came up with a very simple scoring system for meat plants. Like how many cattle can you render insensible with one shot from the captive bolt gun? How many cattle fall down? How many cattle moo and bellow on their heads off? You're only allowed three. You want to pass the McDonald's on it, you can only have three cattle fell around their heads off. And uh, when we first started out, it'd be 20%, 35%, and one horrible plant, 100%. You know, we really cleaned a lot of stuff up here. Now, those are simple measurements that were like traffic rules. This was very, very, very practical. And I got one copy left of Improving Animal Welfare Practical Approach back there. It explains this. This stuff is also on my website on grandon.com. You know, first thing I did is I put the guide light up, guide light up on my website, grandon.com. Um, and having a big company like McDonald's get in there and make a plant clean up, boy, that made a lot of change. See, money talks. All right, let's discuss some of the stuff we got to clean up. Okay, you already had a discussion about cleaning up some of the worst dog places. Now, I have some slides where when I give talks to veterinary students, I trash some of the dog breeding stuff like disgusting bulldogs that can't breathe. Now, I just found out today, and I didn't know about this, that the AKC's been doing things about this, but I didn't know about this. See, this is where your communications has completely failed. You're doing good stuff, and then nobody knows about it. But there's some things we gotta clean up. How about these horses that are just running on a nice, soft dirt, dirt track, and they just break their legs? Well, that's either a genetics problem, because you've overselected for speed, or they're on so many steroids that the bones are falling apart. I don't look at, but the thing is, it's an outcome measure. If a horse breaks its leg just running on soft dirt, something's wrong. And there's a sire there that may need to be uh, removed from the uh, gene pool, or there's a veterinarian that needs to be his license revoked. But the problem you've got here is that there's so much money tied up. There's so much money in here, money corrupts. Corrupts on a lot of things. Um, right now, dairy cows have got problems. We've bred the dairy cow for more and more and more milk. You can't hardly breed them now. The lameness has you know, gotten skyrocketing high. Uh, dairy's got a lot of problems that they need to get clean up. Uh, then we get into things, uh, issues like, um, it's kind of two different issues. There's restrictive housing issues, and then there's what I call biological system overload issues. The horse thing is a biological system overload. We just push the biology to the point where the horse is just falling apart or you select for smashed in nose on a bulldog to the point where they can't breathe anymore. And I gave talks at five different vet schools in 2012 and uh, saw some pretty horrendous uh, pugs and other animals, and I didn't know anything about what the AKC was doing. Heard all about the Morris Foundation, 
but not this other stuff that I just heard about this morning. See, right here, you're just preaching to the choir. Now, there's some restrictive environments we've got to get rid of. South station stalls, that's got to go. I did a survey just prior to September 11th on the airlines. It's this sort of thing, you know, had to do it as a journalist, and because uh, there's no way I could get permission from the airlines to do this. But I'll let the computer at United Airlines pick out somebody to sit beside me, and I show them pictures of sow stalls and pictures of just finishing pigs on slats. And I told them I was a consultant for a major restaurant company on standards for proper pig housing. And I showed them, what do you think of these different pig houses? I was deliberately vague here. And two-thirds of the public had a real problem with putting a sow in a box for most of her life where she can't turn around. Then the industry gets in there and mixes up the issue and goes, well, the farrowing stall, you need that to protect the, uh, the piglets from getting crushed. I'm not talking about the farrowing stall. I'm talking about the gestation stall where the sow is living for most of her life. Let's not confuse the issues here. Farrowing stall, gestation stall. They are two totally separate things. And Gail Golab summed it up very nicely about some of the public's concern. They don't like animals in little boxes. They don't like it when you cut bits and pieces off without anesthetics. And they are um, very concerned about how we kill them. Those are things that uh, Gail Golab brought up a big uh, public concern. She's with the AVMA. But there's some things that we're going to have to fix. There's some serious heat stress problems in feedlot cattle, especially fat black Angus cattle. Been fed a few too many, too many beta agonist products like uh, ractopamine and zopaterol, which are things that make them grow muscle, They're not hormones. Uh, go overboard on that to get heat stress issues. Again, I'm willing to go with the outcome variable. And the outcome variable you can measure there is the cattle should breathe with their mouths shut. We got some people in the industry that say it's okay for cattle to breathe with their mouth open like a dog. No, it's not okay. They're in severe heat stress. See, this is another problem we can get into, bad becoming normal. How do we get into a mess like bulldogs that really messed up with birthing and with breathing? It happens slowly. You want to see what the 1938 bulldog looked like? Go, type, go to Google Pictures. Type in Bulldog's Dilemma. Type that into Google Images, and you'll find a picture of a dog. It's got legs. It's got a snout. It really can function. And there's places where we've got to clean up the house. Let's look at some places in ag where ag's doing a great job. Fair Oaks Farms. You need to go to their website, Fair Oaks Farms. This is a gigantic dairy just outside of Illinois that has become a big tourist attraction. And they have a fantastic website with a calving cam. Everything. You can see everything there. They were on an episode of Dirty Jobs. I mean, it, they, they've done a fabulous job. And right now they're building Pig Adventure. And Pig Adventure is going to be an indoor mm -hmm, factory farm, if you want to use the derogatory term. Um, it's not going to have sow gestation stalls. It's going to have loose housing for the sows, but they will be inside on total slats. And they'll have it all glassed in on the end of the building so people can come and see what goes on in the pig farm. You know, we need to be getting rid of the mystery sheds. We basically need to be totally opening up the doors. There's some things we got to prove. There's some things we got to change. But we need to show, show people that you can use animals for food, you know, for pets, for, for racing or rodeo or whatever, and you can do this stuff responsibly. And I had a chance to go up to the Calgary Stampede, and it was really interesting. It was, some of the bulls were much better behaved than others when it came to really dangerous behavior that would injure the bull kill a cowboy and totally stress the bull out. Um, I think the real good ones become a completely trained animal. Very, very interesting because I was watching them to see how many would get white eye. When they get white eye, that shows they're getting scared. The ones from the really good contractor would go out the gate bucking and they had a soft brown eye. Now that's when I was sitting there behind them, the shoots. Then I was sitting up in the press box and uh, I don't think anybody knew I was up in the press box. So they used some bulls from the not so good contractor. And they were coming out the top of the chute and bad things like that. I think basically, you've got to show how you can do things right. And then it's going to clean up the house and show it. Now, I have been on a lot of committees for all the different animal ag organizations on animal welfare standards. And there's a bad tendency that I notice happens. The worst producers get on the committees and they want to make standards where the worst people can pass. One of the reasons why my standards work really well that I did with, for the uh, McDonald's audits is we put those standards where the top 25% would pass. And then we did give the plants time to work up. But you don't put it to where the lowest common denominator stands. 
Also, they will like traffic rules. You have to make a passing score on five simple outcome variables. We didn't tell plants how to build their stuff, but they had to be able to shoot 95% on the first shot, period. And when we first started, they could only shoot 30% on the first shot, and it was because their equipment was broken. They had broken equipment. They didn't even take care of the equipment that they had. Now, of course, there's a zero tolerance for cutting up anything alive. There's a zero tolerance for that. And any animal that isn't shot on the first shot instantly gets shot again with a second shot. And some people say, well, you actually allow some error. Well, the problem is, if the plant tries to go for 100%, then they miss, and then they're cutting up and hanging up live animals. You know, it's hard for a lot of people that have never worked in the field to understand that things in the practical world can never be perfect. I've had very earnest, very intelligent young people come to me and they say, well, can't you make a slaughterhouse absolutely perfect? No, I can't make a slaughterhouse perfect. It's a practical thing. Are all the doctors perfect on what they do? Are all the veterinarians perfect? No. You can get up to high standard, but it will never be perfect. And this brings up a final thing that I'm seeing in a lot of issues today, is what I call abstractification. As we get more and more people, and this is more of a problem, I think, with younger people than with old people, totally away from doing practical things. They don't know how to sew, they don't know how to cook, they don't know how to do woodworking, uh, they don't do art, they don't do music, they don't do the hands-on things. Then you get a real abstract way of looking at things. And some abstract thing doesn't necessarily work in the field. And I'm seeing big problems with that in Washington, D.C. I mean, it's like, uh, you guys here all know what the Twilight Zone is. But it's like the Twilight Zone, and it's like that old movie Invasion of the Body Snatchers. You know, you turn into a pod when you go to sleep. Well, if you stay inside the beltway too long, you're going to turn into a pod. And there's a real need to get some reality back into things. Where, you, where we find out, you make a policy, what's it going to do to Susie Q over here, and Joe over here, and Jose over here? You know, how is it going to affect individual people? It's too abstract. We've got people going into government where um, they get a college of Drivma, really top university, they go into government, and whatever thing that they're advocating about inside the Beltway, I don't care if they work for the government or they're with a lobbyist group or whatever, they have no practical experience with any of the stuff. And it all gets into the power struggle, and, and let's look at things much more, you know, if we take the money that was spent on the attack ads. I mean, I could build a very nice airport with the money that was spent with attack ads. We spend more money in this country fighting over patents than we do inventing things. We've got to get back to doing real stuff. Okay, if you want to understand what big amounts of money are worth, if you ever go to our Denver airport, it's worth $5 billion. Now it's getting a new hotel put on it now. That's probably going to up it up to us. And railroad, that's going to go up to probably $7 billion. But then you don't really understand what that money is. Like when the original stimulus packets went out, that was equal to two Denver airports for every state. Well, I've been around in all over the country. I haven't seen anything that resembles two airports in every state. I've seen little piddly, uh, stupid little paving projects but nothing really big. Well, that's what you're, you gotta do. You guys have gotta get out of your box and communicate with the young, and I think we are gonna have some time to do questions. I always like to do questions. Okay, I'm gonna pick somebody, somebody doesn't get their hand up. And we gotta figure out, we gotta figure out practical ways to solve problems. Okay, because my basic ethical philosophy is, yes, it is okay to use animals for food, for pets, for entertainment, but you've uh, work, but you've got to do it, uh, you know, right. Dr. Brandon, what's the best way you've found to engage the interests of young people? Well, first of all, if you don't expose young people to new things, they don't know whether they like it. Uh, there's a book um, called Last Child in the Woods by Richard Louvre, and uh, it talks about getting young people just out in nature. We have a new science museum that's just opened in Fort Collins, and they just had an open field there as part of their outdoor parts. The kids can just go out and play in the grass, not, not, not manicured grass, tall grass, in, in an open field. We've got, you know, we've got to, we've got to get out in schools. And the other big thing is, um, you know, electronic media. 
I mean, I can't, I mean, I've got 2.6 million people to see my pig stunning video. Um, I couldn't go out and actually talk to that many people. I had a student that was from the city, her name's Lily, and she now works as an animal welfare specialist for JBS, one of our very big meat companies. Lily came from a background of, of nothing to do with farm animals. She had studied primate behavior. And she got out to Colorado State with a city background and no interest in farm animals, and she found out she liked farm animals. But if you don't expose kids to them, how are they going to learn about them? You've got to expose kids to interesting things to get them interested in interesting things. I do a lot of talks, you know, for autism. And of course, in autism, at one end of the spectrum, you've got the next Steve Jobs and Einstein. And at the other end of the spectrum, you've got somebody really handicapped. I make sure I tell them about the stuff they can go online and learn free programming classes at Coursera or Udacity. There's all this good free stuff online in between the porn sites and all the dog crap that's out there on the internet. There is a lot of really good stuff out there. We got to, no, you got, that's what you got to do. I mean, I'm sure all of you got Facebook friends that are young people. Well, show what you do with dogs. Dogs are really a great thing to work with. Or I tell ranchers, what's chores to you is interesting to the public. Something to be a total bore to you, the public thinks it's interesting. One time I typed cattle feedlot into YouTube, and in the top 10 hits, I got a loader scooping up grain. That is something that a rancher or a feedlot, I mean, that's totally boring. A loader scooping up grain? That's a, that's a boring thing. But to some kid in the city, that's interesting. You see, things that Things will interest the public. I found with the Hollywood Press, uh, they had this gigantic convention of all cable channels showing off their stuff. And so I had 75 Hollywood Press in this room. They didn't want movie questions. They didn't want to say, well, what was it like to talk to Claire Danes? They didn't ask that kind of stuff. They wanted to know how cattle stuff worked. That's what the Hollywood Press wanted to know. That's more like the general public. The general public's view on just about every issue in this country would be, is in between radicals on either side of any issue. You know, we've got to talk to the general public. But then on the other hand, there's some things that have to be cleaned up. Broken legs on racehorses, uh, dairy cow lameness problems, some extreme confinement stuff, uh, you know, some heat stress problems in cattle. Cattle handling's gotten a lot better. That's really improved. That used to be my top issue now for um, cattle feedlots, was handling. No, it's not my top issue now, it's heat stress, which is basically a uh, biological system overload problem. No, they're going to have to solve that. There's things that do have to be fixed. I mean, I'm still appalled at the amount of uh, genetic problems dogs have. <laughs> Just appalled. I've just been reviewing some literature on that because I've got a new textbook coming out next year. It's the second edition of Genetics and the Behavior of Domestic Animals. We're in the process of just finishing it up right now, and it'll be published uh, sometimes next year by Academic Press, uh, which is part of Elsevier. Okay, let's have a few other questions. Okay, right there. Um, All right, let's just talk about a little history. Uh, on the whole animal advocacy scene. I started out in the early 70s, and all the animal advocacy groups uh, worked to improve animal agriculture. In, in the 70s, the Humane Society of the United States funded the development of the center track restrainer system, that is a piece of equipment that I eventually developed for the plants. They funded research that showed that the idea of the way the center track holds the animal is a humane, low-stress way to hold them. There was a $60,000 grant that came from a consortium called the Council for Livestock Protection. And it consisted of HSUS, the American Society for uh, SPCA, American Humane, Massachusetts SPCA, and Fund for the Animals. Then they funded another $100,000 grant in the mid-80s to make the first real center track restrainer. Uh, that, that was in a veal, um, a veal slaughter plant. And then the next one for the big cattle was made in 1990. And that was funded by an independent activist group. So activist groups used to fund stuff to improve animal agriculture. See, now that's totally shifted. That has completely shifted. And, and, uh, you know, and the group that's shifting has been a younger crowd that's got different views. Okay, we get back to our demographic divide here, young versus old. 
uh, you better start crossing that one. That showed up in the election, too. There are interesting charts in the New York Times on the election, all these maps and charts. Uh, you might want to go look at those really carefully. Okay. Um, I'm from Colorado. We have looked at maybe going into CSU and doing kind of an outreach for the readers community to the university. I'm sure other states would have the same thoughts. Can you make suggestions? Well, let's do outreach to the vet schools. I mean, I went to five vet schools in 2012, and I did not know what the AKC was doing, all this research money. I knew about Morris. That's the only thing I knew about. I'll tell you, the SCABVA groups, which are the student veterinary groups, that's the student veterinary medical, it's called SCAVMA, S-C-A-V-A, SCAVMA. Uh, and I, I get invited by them because they're hungry for information on animal behavior. Reach out to the SCAVMA, the student veterinary groups, and go in and do a talk uh, to, to them about some of the things you're doing. You know, work with them. There's a lot of ways to reach out to young people. You know, social networking stuff. You know, the other thing is, there was a cute video you showed this morning. It was a little bit too much PR fluff. I'm going to be perfectly honest. Um, I was a lot more interested in, you know, the amount of money and stuff that was put into this research that people don't know about. It. You're doing good things at the AKC, and nobody knows about it. Just in my class a, a, a few a weeks ago, I trashed the AKC because I didn't know what you were doing. You know, about all those awful dogs you know, that can't breathe. I went to a veterinary school two years ago and they showed me a pug that was bored flat. And even after the nasal surgery, it still couldn't, it still went, <laughs> that's what it sounded like when it breathed. Um, that was just two years ago. These stu and the students that showed me that dog, and they brought in this big lecture hall and the whole, all the, like 200 or more students saw it, didn't know what you were doing either. So it start with the veterinary students. That's where you need to start. And then on the other hand, we've got to clean up the bad stuff. You know, you've still got, um, I've been reading stuff about this, all the drugs going into racehorses. They, um, you know, in Europe, they're not allowed to use all that garbage. Um, you know, filling horses up full of steroids. Well, the bottom line is, is that horses that break their legs when they're running on soft dirt, something's drastically wrong. And if I rule out steroids, which weaken the bone, then I think, that the, those certain sires need to be removed from the gene pool and killed it. So that uh, they're taken out of the gene pool. Does your new book that's coming out trash dog readers? <laughs> uh, well, no, it doesn't. It, do, it does uh, trash biological system overload. I've got a pig example in there. Um, anytime you over-select for a single trait, it doesn't, it says it's a scientific book, I just went into the literature. And I went on Google Scholar. How many people know how to do Google Scholar? OK, that's something you need to know how to do. Type Scholar into Google. And uh, you can then get into the scientific literature. You can also look at Science Direct. These are things where you don't have to have a subscription. Uh, and uh, PubMed database. It's good for veterinary stuff. PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D. But now. When you see the $31 paywall comes up, you've got to go back to regular Google to track down the professor. Because the professor's websites are blocked on Google Scholar because there's a copyright fight going on. So you have to back out of Google Scholar, get back on regular Google, and make sure you're on regular Google. You might want to type in Disneyland or something for keyword just to make sure the browser's reset for regular Google. And then you can look up the the, um, the professor's uh, uh, website. But there's a lot of stuff that doesn't come up on regular Google very easily. And I read some pretty alarming articles about all the genetic stuff wrong with dogs. Uh, and these were recent papers, and they were scientific papers. Maybe you need to reach out to the scientific community, too. Because I, I know about a lot of stuff, and I knew about Morris, but there's stuff that you're doing now that I knew nothing about. Well, German shepherds have got problems too. Right. You see, whenever you overselect, see, so you can overselect for an appearance trait. You can also overselect for a production trait. Okay, we're selecting a milk cow, give more and more and more milk. You know what? They're, we're having difficulty breeding them now. See, there's a mechanism in animals that when they get too skinny, 
Nature turns off reproduction. Well, I think we get the dairy cow putting so much into the milk that um, you are having difficulties getting them bred now. See, that's what I call biological system overload. Or the broiler chicken that grows really, really fast and that has leg deformities. Now, the chicken industry has done some things to correct this, but they didn't start to correct it until it got really bad. Let's look at pigs. In the late 80s, the lean line hybrids came in and they selected for three traits, rapid growth, thin back fat, and large rib, a large loin eye size. And uh, then in the early 2000s, they started having horrendous problems with lameness. And it, but nobody did anything about it until it got up to 50% of the market hogs, the young hogs, were lame. So now they've got leg conformation scoring. But what had happened is they were concentrating on the three production traits and had forgotten to look at conformation of feet and legs. So you'd have animals that were posty like this, or they walked on the dew claws. So the two little things that come out of the back of the, of the ankle. And uh, unfor or unfortunately, we aren't, we aren't totally rid of those. I was at a plant just a month ago, and I saw a collapsed ankle, just like a slide I'd taken 10 years ago. Uh, but they'd forgotten about selecting for feet and legs. You see, it gets, what gets you in trouble is single-minded selection for certain traits. Now, the other thing is, if you read about genetics research, and this is going to be in the Genetics and Behavior of Domestic Animals book, second edition, is Mendelian genetics only explains maybe 25% of all genetic variation. Okay, we just learned in the ENCODE project, it's a gigantic big project, like hundreds, several hundred research labs participating, and we don't know all very much about genetics. And, okay, what's called the exome, if you just sequence the exome, that is what's called the coding DNA. That's the DNA that actually becomes, uh, you know, turns into the animal, or the person, or whatever. But then what does the other 95% of that DNA do that doesn't actually code? Now, in the 80s, they used to call it junk. I never believed in that. But then, when they got into the 90s, they started to think about, well, maybe it does something. Now they're finding out that it does do something. It's the gene's operating system. The only problem is, we don't know how it works. And traits can be linked in weird ways. And one thing that's been learned is if, let's say you had a you know, gene in the coding DNA for a certain trait, the piece of the operating system, the non-coding DNA that controls it, they're not physically together. Okay, if you took this whole DNA thing and you stretched it out, it'd be 10 feet long. 10 feet of little microscopic base pairs. Okay, then it winds up like a spiral so I can jam it together like a spring. But then you still can't cram it inside the sperm and the egg, so then it folds like this. And when it folds like that, there was an article in Nature just a month ago, then that, takes a, that brings a piece of coding DNA up against a piece of the non-coding DNA. And one scientist said it's maybe, it may be like a three-dimensional mathematical thing. But you know what? That's just speculation. They don't know how it works. And it's like 75% of all of genetics. The Mendelian stuff call, covers just the simple traits. That covers the simple traits. But it doesn't cover all, all kinds of other linked traits. Like, for example, years ago, Belief wanted to breed a tame fox that wouldn't tear your hand off for the fur hat trade. So he selected foxes that like would approach you, lick your hand rather than bite it off. And in 20 generations, they ended up with a black and white border collie fox. <laughs> now, how, why did selecting a dog, a fox, for tameness make the coat go black and white? Well, it's a linked trait. Why is it linked? I don't know. Maybe it has something to do with the non-coding DNA, which we don't know how it works. I kind of like to look at genetics right now, sort of like if I took a computer and a bunch of flash drives and a bunch of CDs, we'll give a lot of this stuff, throw in a bunch of Intel chips, chips a lot of stuff for destructive testing, and we put that in a time machine, and we send it back 100 years. So they've got power, they can plug in the computer, and they can use it. Uh, would they have any idea how a flash drive stores a movie? They would have absolutely no idea. Now, the CD and the DVDs, uh, they had good microscopes, so they, was, they could see it. It was physical. It was nothing electronic, and, and, and it, it read little pits and valleys in the CD. But how that code works? They would have absolutely no idea how that works. It would all be a big mystery, especially the flash drive. That'd be a super mystery. How do you cram a movie into that thing? You know, how's a movie stored in the flash drive? Well, they just wouldn't know. 
And now with the ENCODE project, I think we've just realized in genetics about 75% or more of it, we don't know how it works. I, I have actually two questions. One is what you're talking about right now, is that in the area of epigenetics? Yeah, epigenetics is just part of it. Okay. No, there's, okay, let's just go through all the different ways that genetics can work. Okay, you got your standard Mendelian stuff. Okay, what epigenetics is, is you got a piece of code. In other words, the code is there for a certain trait, but it's locked out. Okay, you sequence the DNA and you can go, yeah, you got that little piece of code. But what epigenetics does is it puts chemical locks over the code so it can't be expressed. And epigenetics is affected by environmental things, where the other genetics is totally hereditary. But the thing about epigenetics is it can be inher inherited. There's research where people that starved, uh, then, then the next generation has a tendency to get obese because it changed, the epigenetics changed out of metabolizing food. Okay, now other things are uh, things like copy number variations. Okay, you got little nucleotide base pairs. Well, let's say you just get a copying error and you reverse the base pair. Oh, that's what a mutation is. Because in the male person or, or dog, uh, new, uh, the DNA has to be copied every two weeks. Every two weeks, the dog Xeroxes its DNA. So then you get, and the male does that, but then you get copy mistakes. Then you can get things called repeats, where you may have a piece of code, but then you have extra copies. Now this is how the mechanism works for how long a dog's nose is. You get little bits of code, do you have two copies, five copies, you know, 20 copies, that affects some continuous traits. So you basically um, have got the coding DNA and the repeats things that can happen in coding DNA. It also can happen in non-coding DNA, which you don't know how it works. And the epigenetics, that, that can either unlock or lock out. Now, how does a, people might wonder, how does the mechanism work that prevents us as an adult from growing a liver out the top of our head? See, the genes that formed the body plan had to be shot, have to be shot off. And some scientists speculate that what cancer is, is that locks that should be locking out certain things that get unlocked and then you get uncontrolled tumor growth. And then tumors metastasize. Some scientists speculate, and I want to emphasize this is speculation right now. Okay, when you first start out in the embryo, you've got a ball of undifferentiated cells. The one end of it has to be the head end, so it is polarity. Then you have to start laying out the body plan, and you've got cells migrating. That process may be getting unlocked and become metastasis. Now that's something that right now is scientific speculation. But there's a whole vast operating system in the genome. We don't really know how it works. We know that when, when you uh, select animals for different things, or animals evolve different ways, that, the, that evolution and selection changes code both in the coding and the non-coding DNA. I definitely know that. But then you fold this thing all up. And how that all interacts it's a gigantic unknown right now. Epigenetics, they actually know something about that. Because you either lock out a piece of code or you unlock a piece of code. The second part, the second question, and this is all of genetics, but in um, Animals Make Us uh, Human, you talk about things that dogs need to make them happy. And I'm wondering... All right, let's talk about the basic emotions in animals. Okay, the thing that's a problem, People don't communicate outside their boxes. Neuroscience stays in its box. Veterinarians stay in their box. Animal science stays in their box. Psychologists stay in their box. Now the neuroscience literature ever since the 60s has shown that, yeah, animals do have emotional systems. And then Jack Panskap, who's my age, came out with um, you know, four very basic emotional systems and then three other ones. You have fear, that motivates an animal to keep away from predators, and if you stimulate the uh, the fear center, the amygdala, the animal gets all look, gets all scared behavior and scared type physiology. Then you have rage, you stimulate the thalamus. Then you gotta have seeking. That is the dopamine system. That makes the dog go out and do things. That's why one skinny lab is real frisky and just wants to run and chase the ball all the time. And then you got a good service dog lab that's real calm and he's kind of heavy set and he doesn't care about the ball. You see, that's genetic differences in seeking. Then the fourth one you have is separation distress. 
Now, the neuroscientists call it panic, which I think is a bad name because it gets mixed up with fear. But separation distress, like when you take mom away from baby, you get one cow off by itself, it's really upset because it's separated from the herd. So there's, and separation distress and fear are separate brain systems. You can actually genetically select, and this has been done in quail. This is actually in the old version of the genetics book. That you can, you can select quail to be high and low fear. You can also select them to be high and low separation distress. Those are separate systems. You can select animals to be high and low seeking. You know, and there's definitely differences in people. And if the dopamine system is really active, then you have the kind of person that wants to, you know, jump off a, jump from outer space from a balloon in a space suit. And, you know, you've got to be a dopamine junkie to do that. That's not something I'm going to do. And then, of course, you've got sex. And you've got the mother young nurturing. That's the oxytocin system. And then you've got play. And these things are very, very well scientifically documented in the neuroscience literature. And one of the first articles writing about any of this stuff in the animal science literature I wrote in 1997, it's called Assessment of Stress During Handling and Transport. And I wrote another paper with Cheryl Morris and Nancy Earlbeck on reviewing a Panskep research for a companion animal symposium. But you see, there's a certain bias where people don't want to admit that animals have emotions. Now the thing is, let's get back to some of the emotional stuff we talked about this morning. And you know, they said, well then how can you justify eating them if they have emotions? Well, the way I look at it is, those cattle would have never been born. They would have never lived at all. The other thing that people forget, nature's very, very harsh. There's nothing nice about how the hyena rips out your guts and eats the live guts while you're still alive. That's not nice at all. The cats at least will kill you first, but the canids don't kill first. They just tear you apart while you're still alive. People forget that nature's harsh. But we've got to give animals a life worth living. That is the... Uh, UK's uh, animal welfare community's definition of, uh, of uh, welfare. Got him a life worth living. And there's some dogs that don't have a very good life. They say they lock up in the house all day and they're going crazy with separation distress. But you see, some dogs are going to tolerate being locked up alone in the house all day better than other dogs. See, there are genetic differences. There are big individual differences. And these emotional traits can be selected for different ways, just like appearance traits or maybe production traits like weight gain. No, they have emotions. The main difference, if you look at the neuroscience between a human being and a dog, is the size of the cortex. You know, you just dissect the brain out. We got this giant computer up here that no other animal even comes close. And when you look at where the genes are different and where the genetic code is different, you said that dogs had, like you said, somebody said the dog had like 80% of the same genes. Well, most of those genes that are different are in brain development. That's where the, where the different genes, the most different genes are. You know, you still have got, you know, lungs and a heart. That stuff's pretty much the same. Okay, right there. And you mentioned that the public doesn't like uh, cutting up animals or cutting pieces off animals. Well, yeah, that's right. Castration. Well, that's, that's one of the things the public's concerned about that. And uh, there's been a new product that's been developed for pigs where you might be able to get rid of castrating pigs. See, one of the problems you have in pigs, if you don't castrate them, you get boar taint, which means basically your meat smells like boar urine, which is not very nice. And so they came up with a product that actually blocks the secretion of the re releasing factor in the brain that makes the testosterone come out. And I think that's a really good thing. Now, cattle, you don't have a problem with taint, but we basically cut off the natural hormones that you know, come with the bull, and then, and then now that we took all the bull hormones that come with him off, we then uh, fill him up full of implants and beta agonists to turn him back into a bull again. That doesn't make much sense. We take off the natural package, and then we use drugs and hormones to you know, get the growth back. Now, of course, the heifers don't, don't have anything like that. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe to keep things efficient, I have to use some of the stuff on the heifers, but why are we doing it on the bulls? And you get meat quality decrements. You know, when you use those things. Quality and quantity of meat are two opposing goals. You grow fast, big muscles tend to be dried out and tougher. That's very, very well documented in the literature. And you don't have a flavor issue with bulls. Only problem is our grading system won't grade a bull as primary choice. But you know, grading system can be changed. Europe, everything is uh, fed as bulls. Most other countries don't do all the steers that we do. 
Okay? If you're a prime example of somebody outside of the sport of dogs who sees something like a bulldog that has breathing problems and you're totally turned off by it, then how do we convince you and the rest of the public that that is an extreme? Well, you better get pictures and everything out there showing how they should be bred. You better get out there and show in schools the ones you're breeding right. You gotta communicate. I'll get back to communication. You better get some young people hired to work with social networks. How about old people then? All right, old people that work with social networks, that's even better. <laughs> but you better get out there and start communicating with them. And when it comes to speaking engagements right now, I tend to favor talking to students because I do a lot of talks where I combine animal stuff with autism stuff. And I'm very concerned. I see a lot of young students. They're the kids that are kind of quirky and different. They can be the next Steve Jobs, and they're just going nowhere. School systems are trying to cram them all into the same little small box. That just uh, doesn't work. And, and I, I'm very concerned. I want to help those kids to go somewhere. Because if there's any, I'm really concerned about this whole thing in the country right now. We don't do stuff anymore. I mean, our generation, the Republicans built the interstate highway, and the Democrats went to the moon. We did stuff, and we've gotten away from doing stuff. And we have a shortage right now of engineers and computer scientists, because a lot of our kids are not going in, a lot of the quirky different kids, they get all these labels, and, and they start becoming their label, and we're not developing them, so they can do a lot of uh, computer science stuff. There's a, there's a lot of uh, difficulty in uh, complex study, long-term uh, nutritional or health study. Yes, yep. In terms of post points, that there's speculation in the long term post imbalance in human beings causes a lot of the health problems we have. Well, as the U.S. has got an omega 3 deficient diet, right. and, and um, I've talked to a lot of parents of kids that have autism, dyslexia, and other things, and some of them just swear by fish oil supplements. Now, the thing is, is that, is that there's subgroups, and you got one group of kids where fish oil supplements really work, another one it doesn't. It doesn't seem to do much for your heart. But what people forget, the brain is made out of fat. The brain is 10% cholesterol by weight. And when I tried the diet by going the whole low-fat approach, that didn't work. When bagels were being touted as low-fat health food, I gained 30 pounds. <laughs> well, I gave up all the bagels, and the reason I was looking around so much is I didn't have quite enough protein for breakfast. I mean, I'm, there's no way I can be vegan. I've got to have some animal protein, serious animal protein in the morning, or I just end up having problems. And I think there are genetic differences in that. Some people, I think, tolerate a vegan diet a lot better than others do. There are genetic differences in, um, in, in, in a lot of different things. OK? Um, just to get back to that 2012 USA Today survey of school children. Yeah, and that was just one of those little, it wasn't a big, huge article. It was one of those little things that was on the front page of the USA Today down in the corner. And it just was a little chart. It, animal, the, the, when they asked little kids in elementary school what the concerns were, animal welfare, uh, the environmental concerns, and helping other people. That was the order. Yeah, they were in that order. Now, it didn't, um, it didn't have any percentage or anything. It was one of those little tiny charts that was on the front of a USA Today. But what worries me is we're getting kids today that they haven't, you see, you see when you take the hands-on classes out, I think there's a certain resourcefulness. Because I'm finding when I talk to a lot of young parents at autism meetings that they don't think to look stuff up on the internet. And I just read a fascinating book. I got a galley proof for a book called The Spark. And it's about a little autistic kid that was sort of not headed very good with his mom. They, uh, you know, their family had a grandfather who was a scientist. They built things in the shop. All the children were taught how to cook and sew and do um, all those practical things. And the mom noticed that this little autistic kid, when he lined up uh, things, he put them in the spectrum of the rainbow. And then when he was playing games with yarn, wrapping it all around things, he was making patterns with it. And, and this was brilliant. She used to go to Barnes & Noble with him. And I'm not saying it because Barnes & Noble's in the back there. And the kid would, would get into the math books. And then he would sit in Barnes & Noble and read math books. I really liked the idea that Barnes & Noble, more than the just surfing around the internet because there's so much crap on the internet. Then, no, but they still use the internet. Then they'd go home and use the internet to supplement what they had done at the Barnes and Noble. 
And, and this kid uh, very quickly, you know, was uh, doing, uh, was in a college astronomy class when he was eight. And the mom just called up the professor and they just went in there and sat in on the class and well, the students were like, wow, this kid really knows the stuff. Uh, but they built up his strength, but they had to expose him to those interesting books. Because when he was forced just to do little baby drills, he kind of regressed back and started acting a lot more autistic. Now, I want to make it very clear that that doesn't mean that every autistic kid's going to be able to go to college early. That's simply not true. But there's a certain kind of kid with very uneven skills. And you'll see this, sometimes you see them very early. Other times you'll see it around third or fourth grade. And the kid may need special ed and reading, but he needs a college math book. You know, this business about making them all the same is just BS. And then the school didn't want this little, little, um, little elementary school kid to have an algebra book. Well, then finally they got him an algebra book, and he learned it in two weeks. You know, but he's not going to learn it if he isn't, isn't exposed to it. The thing that was so great about the Barnes and Noble is she could go drop them over in the science section, and he could just take out astronomy books and look at them. And these are the kind of books that a lot of libraries didn't have. And I also think Barnes and Noble sold them a bunch of discounted books. <laughs> but this, you've got to expose kids to interesting things to get them in. You, you know, if the kid shows likes math, or, it started out this kid was memorizing license plates and fascinated by the Weather Channel. You know, on the weather reports. You see that? And I've seen a lot of talk to a lot of parents, well, the kid is really into license plates and the Weather Channel. But then it's never taken beyond that point. Kids that get interested in that stuff, you need to just get math books and expose them to them. And there's free, great stuff online. Coursera, it's course and then RA, Coursera, this college course, then RA, Udacity, that's Audacity without the A, Udacity, there's edX, EDX. And then there's also free classes at Stanford, free classes at MIT. I think we also can do free classes at Harvard. Um, there's some fabulous stuff on the internet. But this little kid could just, uh, oh, when the kid was in third grade, his favorite book was the, uh, the study guide for the GED. <laughs> Not kidding, that was his favorite book. Which he read and passed really quickly. But you've got to expose them to stuff. And I think some of the problems we got right now with young people is they're just not getting exposed to fun stuff you do with, with dogs and birds and other animals. You've got to expose, you gotta expose kids to interesting stuff to get them interested in interesting stuff. That's what you've got to do. And, and, and get rid of all the PR fluff BS and let's just get kids in their training rocks. You know, or, or okay, there's some bird fanciers, you know, uh, you know the, the parrots are really cool or, you know, Whatever you do, you've got to get them exposed to it. It's just like Lily. When Lily came out to CSU, every weekend she was out weighing cattle with Terry for the nutrition. Terry's one of our other professors on Terry's nutrition trial. And uh, nobody made Lily go out and weigh cattle. She just got out there and when she got exposed to beef cattle, she found out she liked beef cattle. She liked pigs too. But she wouldn't have found out, and she was a young person. But she wouldn't have found out that she liked them if she hadn't been exposed to them. You know, in other words, she came out from Rhode Island. She got interested in studying with me. And I said, Lily, if you study with me, it's going to have to be pigs or cattle or maybe sheep. You know, because we do farm animals in our department. And she got out and she got exposed to them. And she liked them very much. I don't know how the time's doing. Okay, right over there. Oh, kids love to interact with animals and with the horseback riding. So many parents have told me that their autistic kids had their first word on a horse. I'm all for this having kids get involved with animals. And, and then, okay, then you get some people that criticize, okay, we have a dolphin swim thing and, and then you're stressing out the dolphins. The best way to avoid that problem is the dolphin needs to be able to get away if it wants to. In other words, you do it in a big enough pool that when the dolphin's had it, he can get away. And, and I, you know, because if you don't get, if kid, I think kids actually have to touch and see animals. Because I, I was really surprised that in Denver, the zoo has more visitors than either one of the stadiums has got. Kids are, you know, kids have got to see the real thing. 
they've got to see the real thing. And, um, you know, we're, and kids today are just getting totally separated from that. And you all ought to get that book, Last Child in the Woods. That's a great book. Um, Barnes and Noble will be happy to order it for you. Uh, Dr. Bannon, do you have any personal pets? I can't. I am traveling 90% of the time. I live on a road. And, I, and if I'm lucky, I get home uh, for one day a week just and pay the bills, make sure the phone bill and my American Express card's paid, you know, stuff like that. So I can't. I. Oh, if I retire, yes, but I don't think I'm going to retire. I'm going to just keep working until I drop dead. <laughs> okay, well, I'll keep talking. It looks like I'm getting a signal here that maybe this lady over there in the pit. How are we doing time-wise? Okay, right there. I'll keep talking until I get a signal that's lunchtime. Uh, on the plane coming here, uh, from Maine, I, I did get from page 63 of your recommended animal handling guidelines. Okay. Uh, of course, I had a middle seat, and uh, there was a woman next to me, and, and she's looking over, and we're thinking about putting using the bolts or the electric. Oh, yeah, she was reading that, okay. I, get, I got much more room than she. <laughs> but you know what? But you know what? I find, but I find a lot of people are really curious about that stuff. Because when I talk to people and explain what I do, and then, and then I, I, you know, most of the comments we've gotten on the video have been good. You know, people are curious. They, a lot of people just want to know, and if you explain it to them. But they don't, what they don't realize is that the emphasis that is put on the animals being calm. But you've got you to explain that to them. Did you talk to that passenger? Pardon me? Did you talk to that passenger, or did you just let them move away from you? No. I well, then that's your mistake. No, you need to talk. You need to talk to them. I had no idea. I don't know. The American public does not know that keeping that animal quiet. But that's what you. But that's your job. To that's our job to communicate that. And and the other thing is, we've got to police the bad stuff because I'll tell you, in the '80s and the and the and the '90s, the plants were terrible. They were just terrible. And there's still bad things going on. And then there's a problem of when your back is turned, people acting bad. And these videos that just came out this year, that Central Valley Meats thing, that was a real mess. And what's ending up, uh, some of the companies now, like Cargill, have put video cameras into their plants that are audited by an outside auditing firm over the internet. So that solves the problem of people acting good when the clipboard person is standing there. And I'm a big advocate of that. Um, no, but you're, we got to communicate it. I, I, you know, I've, I've been around now for 40 years working in this field, and I've done a lot of things to improve slaughterhouses, so we'll not call them harvest facilities. And what frustrates me is the public doesn't know very much about it. Now, the HBO movie, uh, the cattle handling in that movie, those dip fats, they were real. That stuff was all real. Then the drowning is just done with uh, editing. That was done with editing, with a fake animal drowning. But all the other cattle handling actually was real. This will be our last question. Okay. I haven't heard your book, which mentions about the last child in the woods. Do you have an opinion about urban parks that are manicured and they're so... Well, I think the parks need to have some kind of wild areas where the kids can go out and catch grasshoppers and, and uh, do all of those kinds of things and explore. I can remember in our elementary school, we had this scummy old pond. And we'd go catch polywogs in there and grub around in that. We thought that was just wonderful. Oh, oh we got dirty. No, and I, I um, no, kids need to get out and get into that stuff. That's the kind of stuff we got to do. And kids are really getting too separated from nature. You know, and we need to get them off of some of the, you know, devices for a while and get them out uh, doing things. I mean, just look at what the. Uh, how, how uh, therapeutic riding has got to be such a popular thing. I think that's a really good thing. And then we do have to make sure that uh, the horses don't get stressed. Because if you have a rider with CP that doesn't balance right, and you always ride around to the right, you can actually make the horse lame. You've got to make sure that you then circle around going in the other direction so the horse isn't lame. We've got to show people that we can, you know, that animals can, you know, we can use them for sport, you know, for um, entertainment, for pets, for food. And we, but well, we got to give that animal a decent life that's worth living. And we've got to clean up some bad stuff. We need to clean up some of the really bad stuff, 
And then we need to just open up the door. And electronically is the way to open up the door. Okay, well, I think that ends, and I'll be around at lunch. Thank you very much. <laughs>